All right, let's get started. Um, welcome everyone uh, to our talk about Thanos, absorbing Thanos infinite powers for a multi-cluster telemetry. I'm Frederick, I'm the founder and CEO of Polar Signals, and today I have with me Kemal and Bartek. Hello Hi. everyone. Hello. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kemal, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I'm working for a platform observability team, and I'm also a Thanos maintainer. Um, my name is Bartek, and I work with uh, with Kemal as software engineer as well in OpenShift monitoring team. And I am Prometheus maintainer, a co-founder of Thanos, and I also am a tech lead of Seek Observability CNCF. All right, super cool. Um, so let's get get right to it. Um, so. For some of you, you may be entirely new to Thanos. So uh, we want to give you a quick overview of uh, what Thanos is. And this is kind of a reoccurring um, slot at KubeCons where we kind of talk about um, introduction to Thanos for those who are new to it. But then the second half is kind of what's happened um, in the recent past in the Thanos project kind of as an update so that everybody doesn't have to necessarily follow the GitHub repos and follow what, what's happening, but can just every now and then join some of these sessions and uh, and kind of see what's new. So that's uh, kind of what we're going to be doing today. And I'll kick us off with uh, the introduction. Then Kemal uh, and Batek will take over with uh, with what's new. So when, when I talk about Thanos, I often like to refer to it as kind of distributed Prometheus++. What I mean by that is Prometheus is kind of intentionally a monolithic application, right? Um, the, the storage is in the same binary. The scraping is, the querying is. Everything is intentionally monolithic to kind of increase reliability that we can have on this process. Um, that's really great for Prometheus, but it kind of limits Prometheus in a little bit um, in terms of like horizontally uh, scaling uh, Prometheus, because obviously you can only scale as much as a single machine can. Um, and that, that isn't to diminish the, the need uh, for Prometheus. You'll later see how Prometheus and Thanos harmonize really nicely together. But Thanos is kind of um, the additional bits and pieces to make Promethe turn Prometheus into um, a global scale monitoring system. And so a couple of things that Thanos provides on top of Prometheus is um, a global view so that you can query data across all of your Prometheus instances, long-term storage so that you don't have to only rely on the local disk that a Prometheus has available, and then a couple of other features that are neat. Um, probably the most interesting one being downsampling, which is kind of related to um, long-term storage because when we talk about storing long-term metrics data, we tend to also query that data long term. But when we scrape um, data or collect data at 15 or 30 second intervals, but query it over a year, we're not actually interested in that super high resolution data. We don't even have enough pixels on our screen to show all of this data. And so downsampling comes in really handy in those kind of situations, because if we query data over a year, it's plenty enough to um, query data at a one hour resolution, for example, um, and still get an accurate picture. As a matter of fact, you would still get exactly the same picture, but downsampling um, drastically speeds up these kinds of queries. So this is just a very high level overview of, um, of what Thanos provides. Um, and I also often, the in terms of the analogy that I mentioned earlier, what I also like to say is that Thanos essentially pulls Prometheus apart into its individual modules. So the query layer, the um, rule evaluation, the storage, et cetera, um, and puts these into individual components so that we can then horizontally scale those. And as a matter of fact, Thanos tries to implement um, as little as possible and make as much reuse um, as possible from Prometheus. So Thanos tries to just kind of fill the gap and not reinvent things, but build on top of giants essentially being Prometheus here. So what that kind of results in, and I like to um, describe it as a toolkit because Thanos provides a number of components um, and you can really pick and choose these components 
to build the monitoring stack your organization really needs. Um, Thanos gives you all the components, and then you can choose what really suits your organization. Um, and we'll see in a little bit what, uh, what that can um, mean practically. Um, but the components that are available are the querier, the store component, and we'll see in a little bit um, and clarify a bit more, the rule component, the compactor, um, the sidecar component, and the receiver. Um, this is just a, just a list, um, just so, so you can refer to this list later um, once we go through um, examples of uses of all, all of these components. So let's dive right in and get to the first uh, kind of example um, usage. And this is probably the most common thing that I see people starting out with with Thanos. And I, if you're just starting out, um, this is what I would probably recommend uh, you, you trying out. So you may be just be running Prometheus already. And you want to run Prometheus in, high, in a high, highly available manner, obviously, um, because this is your monitoring system. You kind of are relying on your monitoring system to monitor the rest of your infrastructure. So you want that to be available, right? Um, and then the typical thing when we're not using Thanos, just with Prometheus, what we tend to do is we put a load balancer in front of Prometheus and um, we query um, our two Prometheus servers through that load balancer. Now, this is a little bit problematic, but why? The problem is because Prometheus is a pull-based model, um, the Prometheus, Prometheus servers that we're seeing here are scraping the same targets, but at slightly offset at intervals. So that means while for alerting purposes, they're close enough, when you're querying data and graphing it over time, um, this can lead to inconsistencies. And so this tends to be problematic or at least confusing to users. Um, this gets uh, more problematic when we talk about rollouts, for example. There may be slight gaps um, in one Prometheus or the other, or maybe one Prometheus has downtime and the other one doesn't. And then there's kind of gaps in data. And this is exactly where the first Thanos component comes in super handy, being the Thanos courier. Um, and the Thanos courier is essentially a layer that you can put on top of um, these Prometheus servers to have a global view. And what the Thanos courier does here is it queries both Prometheuses for all the data they have available for a particular query, and then merges these um, using a deduplication algorithm and presents you with one consistent um, result. And the way that this integration kind of works is through the Thanos sidecar. The sidecar is really just a shim between uh, Prometheus and uh, Thanos. And uh, it really just converts Thanos API calls, gRPC calls, into Prometheus native API calls. Um, and this is already a really, really useful example of how people can make use of Thanos. And it's a very common thing that people do. You may just stop here. Um, and um, this is already extremely useful. I want to take a moment to talk about something that I personally find very exciting about the Thanos project, which is the store API. Pretty much everything in Thanos that can serve data, serve time series data, um, serves what we call in Thanos the gRPC store API. And so this is essentially in a, a data exchange format that everybody can implement and then serve data through that. And this is exciting because every component in Thanos implements this, um, this API. And something that I personally found really ingenious about Thanos when I first started working with it is that the courier itself um, implements the store API as well. And so what that allows us to do is actually, if we want to layer um, Thanos in a, um, in a distributed way, essentially, we can have regions of Thanos clusters, let's say one per data center, or because we're at KubeCon, um, one per Kubernetes cluster, um, and then have a global query layer that we layer on top of that. And that works because the Thanos querier implements the store API as well. And so this is why, why I often refer to Thanos as a toolkit, right? Um, because we can pick and choose and architect our 
a monitoring system to exactly the way that um, our organization needs and only to the extent that our organization needs because we could build an arbitrarily complex and arbitrarily featureful um, monitoring system, but it's so much better if people can actually just have the complexity that they truly need, right? And so I think that's what's really powerful about the Thanos project. But these, these are just two kind of examples um, of what Thanos can do. Um, I talked about long-term storage being one of the primary things that Thanos provides, right? So let's talk about how that um, can look like as an example. Long-term storage in Thanos always revolves around object storage. And so the way that that happens is essentially that these sidecars that I talked about earlier kind of converting the Tano store API calls to Prometheus native API calls, it actually has a second um, kind of responsibility, which is it whenever Prometheus um, produces data on disk, it takes that data and uploads it to object storage. Um, now, pretty much every um, object storage provider um, from any like well-known um, cloud provider is supported by, by Thanos. Um, and many of the kind of the ones that you can run yourself as well. Um, basically anything that's Amazon S3 compatible works. Um, and then the way that you can actually query this long-term data is by using the Thanos store component. This uh, component, again, implements the Thanos store API, um, but instead of interfacing with a Prometheus server, it reads that data from object storage and then provides it to the courier whenever you query it. Um, a prompt kill query. Um, and then in this kind of scenario, the last component that you would make use of is the compactor. If you're maybe already familiar with database technologies, compaction is kind of the process of post-optimizing data um, in a database. And so what that means here is that the compactor looks at data that is in object storage and sees where there are uh, possibilities for merging data to make it um, more efficient to in, uh, improve compression or deduplicate things. Um, there are various things that the compactor can do. Um, and I won't get into too many things um, about that, but you can think of it as um, a data optimization post-processing uh, component. The compactor itself doesn't actually serve any data. Whenever it replaces some data in object storage, the store just loads that and from there on serves that optimized data. Um, so that's how we do um, long-term storage. And uh, uh, one thing that I forgot to mention is the compactor also takes care of downsampling. Remember when I said that downsampling is really useful for querying um, long-term data? Well, this downsampling actually needs to be computed somewhere, right? So the compactor is one of those things, uh, what, uh, is the component that does, does that. Um, so these are, this is my, probably um, the next step that you would take if you go with the um, with the previously mentioned architecture uh, of like introducing Thanos um, into your organization. And here we can also also see the nice uh, kind of iterative process that we can take of um, introducing Thanos into your organization. You can start with just the courier and the sidecars, right? But if you want long-term storage, well, then you add object storage, the store component, and the compactor. And just like that, you can kind of upgrade your um, monitoring system based on your actual organization's needs um, and not just throw a bunch of um, processes into your, into your organization that you may not even need, right? So um, I, th I think it's always important to kind of evaluate what your organization really um, is looking for and then kind of architect the monitoring system to those needs. And this is where we come to the next architecture. And this is really a very different type of architecture than from what I've talk been talking about so far, which is um, something that I was very heavily involved in um, or still am very heavily involved in, in the Thanos project being when you have a kind of service relationship with your Prometheus server. So you may have totally remote Prometheus servers that may be on edge infrastructure or something like that. And you want to push that data as opposed to having all the Thanos components 
pull data whenever it wants to um, query something. In this kind of scenario, you may want to push this data so that it's um, available um, at a low latency, essentially. Um, and what we have for that is what we call the receive component. So this component implements the remote write protocol from Prometheus. This is essentially a generic, um, almost database replication type protocol that Prometheus uh, implements um, that you can just use to send off all data that Prometheus um, writes to disk um, off, to a, off to a remote storage. And the receive component implements exactly that. Um, and I won't get into too many details of how that works, but it's essentially a Dynamo style um, replicated um, hash ring. And then once that's kind of received and stored by the receive component, um, you can configure the Thanos querier to query all these received nodes, merge all the data um, at query time, and as, again, present a deduplicated um, result to you. So this is a very different type of architecture, but also one uh, that has become increasingly popular because you can very nicely kind of separate um, the, the responsibility of running this Thanos cluster and people just running Prometheus servers and just pushing all their data for long-term storage for long-term analysis um, into this um, service type relationship. So with that, um, this is kind of this kind of concludes the um, architectures that I wanted to present today um, as an introduction to Thanos. And just to reiterate, um, and I hope this has kind of become clear to everyone, Thanos is really a toolkit that you can use to build exactly the um, monitoring monitoring system that your organization needs. Um, and you can pick and choose from all these wonderful components to build exactly that. Um, and at heart, the thing that really powers all of this is the store API, this kind of generic API that we have for reading data in Thanos. Um, and again, um, this is kind of why um, we can have this toolkit kind of approach, um, because we can just swap out implementations even, right? So I think that's really powerful. And that's one of the things that makes me really excited about the Thanos project. Um, but with that, um, that kind of concludes the introduction. And now I'll hand it off to Kemal um, to tell us what kind of has been happening lately in the Thomas project. All right. I hope you can see my screen. So let's get to the news. Uh, so we've been busy for the past months. Uh, we've implemented a couple of new features, and we have a lot of uh, optimizations regarding uh, all the components over the board. So let's uh, start with uh, querier. Uh, for the querier, now we can we have the ability to concurrently uh, execute select queries. Uh, so this would uh, really could be helpful for the queries that you, for the complex queries that you have with multiple select statements. And moreover, now we have a couple of uh, like multiple layers of uh, caches, uh, especially using memcached. Uh, using this uh, functionality uh, for the store uh, gateway component, we can actually uh, cache the metadata files and uh, chunks itself. And this kind of helps us uh, to reduce the uh, traffic and latency between the object store and your like uh, data cluster. Uh, moreover, uh, now we uh, introduced a new component called Thanos Query Frontend. Uh, this component, uh, will be splitting your queries uh, for certain intervals and then it will be uh, caching the responses of your queries and that will uh, be kind of as, uh, hope that this will uh, improve your query performance significantly and i'm gonna uh, demo it in a bit uh, moreover we have a lot of uh, ui uh, enhancement uh, now we have a new uh, component for uh, what we call bucket view for all the components that actually serves uh, blocks. Uh, and with using this uh, UI, you can actually introspect your blocks. Uh, and uh, for the last update, uh, now we have uh, an new UI based on uh, React components. And uh, we are like reusing components from Prometheus itself. And uh, we also plan to uh, publish a components library in the long run so that we can reuse uh, other uh, reuse these components in the other 
project as well, thanks to our mentees. So for this part, this is how it actually looks right now for the querier. One of the cool features that we have recently implemented is, is the enabling to st uh, store filters. Uh, with this, you can actually select uh, which store do you want to query uh, to uh, debug that uh, particular store API component. And this is how the new bucket viewer looks like. Uh, you can see your blocks uh, with the different intervals and, and different sizes of blocks, and you can see their metadata information. And you can actually download the metajson file itself if you want to further debug things. With that, uh, let's get to the demo. Uh, and in this part, I'm gonna, uh, like we will talk about a simple architecture, uh, which we use uh, Sidecar, uh, fun of Sidecar uh, instead of uh, Prometheus. And for each for our each cluster, we will deploy a Prometheus. And we then we will, for to have a global uh, overview, we will deploy a querier and user gonna read that. What makes this uh, demo special will be the, our new component query frontend, and we will try to uh, demo you uh, how we can actually reduce the latencies. So for that, let me. So um, for our demo purposes, we will use Katakoda so that uh, viewers can later on visit the same tutorials and they can actually uh, interact with the, those things themselves. So let's start. So in our demo, we will just uh, first deploy Prometheus. And for each Prometheus, you can see we kind of configure uh, scrapes, uh, configure Prometheus to scrape themselves. And for each cluster, we will have one Prometheus. And for each Prometheus, we will deploy Prometheus plus a ton of sidecar aside. This could take a minute. Okay, this was fast. Nice. Let's see if everything's work. Yeah. So for this demo, we are using Docker uh, to uh, just Docker to make things simple, and you can see all the processes are kind of running. Uh, from now on, we are we will uh, deploy the Thanos uh, query for like global overview. For sake of demo, we are also deploying a sidecar proxy to kind of inject some latency to the querier because we don't have enough data to actually create and load in, uh, in this environment. And now uh, we can actually access our query front end. And for the last part, let's deploy Thanos query front end. For that, we have a configuration for the cache which uh, tells us to actually cache everything in, in, in memory. And we kind of deploy it now. And let's go to, yes, OK. I hope you can see that. This is a Thanos query frontend UI. It's actually the same with the Thanos query. So when we execute, let's make it a bit bigger. and. When we actually execute a query, a query uh, a, to be specific, a range query, it's supposed to get uh, more than five seconds because we also, yeah, injecting some latencies. Uh, yeah, for this query, it takes over five seconds, but now it uh, should be cached. And when we execute this again, this should be a lot faster. Yeah, as you can see now, it uh, took only one second. And uh, one of the other, like one of the things that we specified over here uh, is the split interval. So in, when we are executing this query, we actually split this query by a minute. Uh, so it, 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 it behind the scenes actually executed five different queries and cached all the results of it. We also uh, specify another thing called uh, max freshness. And this max freshness actually says that like it, it splits the query, but it kind of uh, it doesn't cache the uh, mo uh, the most recent one. So to actually demonstrate that we have the same query, it's yeah fast enough. But now we can kind of 
shift these things a bit and we can see it's still fast. So yeah, uh, this is relatively a new component for us. So it would be great for if you can just use and give us feedback and so that we can improve and work more on these components. With that said, I'm going to pass uh, the microphone to Bakak. Thank you, Kemal. Thank you, Frederick. So, um, so Kemal mentioned about a few things we uh, we created over our last months, but that's not everything, right? We we actually um, did much more. And from the high level things, it's worth to mention um, kind of stuff around APIs and and the user experience. So, first of all, we kind of because well, thanks of the of the fact that we. Um, that we use Prometheus code, it was as easy as upgrading the, the few dependencies to get um, shiny new TSDB isolation mechanism, uh, which allows, um, well, kind of appends and queries to be um, kind of isolated. Um, and, and, and that's pretty sweet. Um, furthermore, we are active on the analytic API side. So we are actually with the seek observability. So it's, uh, a special interest group on the CNCF side, we are collaborating on kind of exploring the use cases and, and APIs that an integration that would allow us to better leverage uh, metric data for analytic use cases. So for example, this is like our POC, uh, Opslytics um, project, which allows you to um, convert Prometheus and uh, Thanos metrics into the parquet file. So this is pretty convenient. We are uh, planning to add more, more you know, APIs and formats uh, like Apache Arrow or maybe um, um, Arrow itself and, and Pandas and stuff. So all of this, um, well, if you have any ideas, please, and, and feedback and want to help and join us here, yeah, please visit this this repo. We are, we are uh, your help is welcome. One thing that I want to focus as the last thing for this talk is um, kind of multi-tenancy aspect, because um, especially when building centralized monitoring system like Thanos with long-term storage retention, you really think about like long-term use cases when more teams will use the same system and uh, you know how they can collaborate do i need to create a, another thanos cluster just for a separate team what if you are a SaaS provider and you have you know customers that are not part of the same custom organization but actually you know uh, they their data have to be securely isolated right we actually build thanos in mind with that obviously with the multi dynasty features being um like in more advanced part of the story of Thanos. But well, here we are after um, third year of, of, of um, Thanos products. So I want to demo and, and kind of showcase you um, a way of making Thanos a multi-tenant multi, multi system, a configuration and deployment model describing that. So let's go for that. So I will describe what we will see in the demo. So um, first we'll introduce kind of two set of let's say, um, tenants Prometheus's tenants data. We call first team fruit and second vegetable, veggie. Um, so you can see they have separate collection path. They already have uh, set up Thanos with Sidecar so they can query their own data. And because you have this separate kind of infrastructure for both team, uh, for each team, you kind of expect the isolation. And um, so without, this is no multi-tenant, um, infrastructure. It's rather a separate infrastructure for, for each tenant, but yeah, technically it works, right? But there are problems with that. And especially with bigger, bigger systems, you get into this, I, I, we call it tomato problem. Tomato, because um, if you're aware, this is actually both fruit and vegetable in the same time. So um, if you are from, let's say, a tomato team, you would like to have access to both fruits and vegetable data. So this particular problem is called like cross tenant um, view. So it's actually important to have a secure way to allow joins between different data sets from different tenants. So this is kind of something you cannot easily achieve with this, um, with this particular deployment. Um, additionally, what if you have more teams, right? And uh, how do you scale if you need to set up a separate cluster or a separate, uh, you know, kind of infrastructure for each tenant? That doesn't scale well. So ideally you want to raise more and have some multi-tenancy system. And Thanos was 
definitely um, thinking about that use case for a long time. Um, so let's do first step. Obviously, we can um, you know join this data within single global view. So put like multi tenant querier, and um, and allow accessing the data from both to, to team fruit and to veggie. However, because we believe in tunnels in the Unix philosophy where you are, you know, doing one thing, one functionality and doing it good. So you don't want to spread your focus. That's why there is no like, you know, direct ALF or airbag system built into the tunnels. However, we integrate with and we kind of build ecosystem on top of that. So to achieve this, um, Red Hat actually built um, Prom Label Proxy project, which is uh, part of the Prom Use Community Org. So you can add that as a sidecar. And this properly understand uh, Prometheus API, so actually Thanos APIs as well, um, HTTP ones for, for querying and um, accessing metadata and all of the source stuff, and injects the proper tenant uh, label of your choice into the query system to ensure the data isolation. The critical path here is kind of how we separate tenants between themselves, how we identify them. And we do, we use the same mechanism for, uh, as for anything else, as for series, as for TSDB blocks, we use labels. So tenant is just another label for us. And you will see that on the demo. So thanks of uh, prom label proxy and some authorization proxy of your choice, because we don't want to, you know, force you to use IDC or whatever. So um, with that, you can easily set up uh, a multi-tenant read path that isolate queries depending on the password or maybe port that uh, that is exposed to the certain team. Um, so we can either have dedicated views or uh, cross-tenant views for any of use cases. So let's try to actually demo it quickly. Um, for this, we um, I also use Katakoda. Hopefully, we can expose that um, after KubeCon um, for the for the public use. So let's go for that, um, and let's start with just starting those Prometheus. We have uh, Prometheus for Team Fruit. Let's copy configuration for that, and two replicas for Team Veggie. Let's copy those files, and now let's prepare a directory for. Um, for our Prometheus, let's start the Prometheus. It might um, take some time. Actually, well, we started. Um, let's create a sidecar up to that. Let's now create uh, Team Veggie Prometheus and sidecar, and another Prometheus and sidecar. As you can see, I can I, I'm using just Docker machines uh, for for um, for simple showcase. And let's start, you know, with no data tenancy model. Um, so this means that we start a separate query for veggie and for fruit teams. And um, so it should look like um, we, I presented before. So let's try to access our queries. Let's see how it goes. So uh, as you can see on store page, we can only see one uh, sidecar from team fruit. So it's kind of obvious that we will have only data from the team fruit. Yep. Now, um, I can quickly show you the veggie one, but it, it's pretty similar. You only have data for Team Veggie. And there are two replicas, so you have two, um, two, um, two values because there are two Prometheuses that are scraping themselves and kind of each other. OK, but we have tomato problem, as we, as we describe, and we have also reuse infra so problem. So let's try to build a multi-tenant um, read path for Thanos. So, Let's stop our queries because we want to set up a one multi-tenant query that will be safe to use. Uh, let's start that. Um, the difference here is that we just point to all the stores, so all the sidecars we have for both Team Veggie and Team and Team Fruit. Um, without anything else, as we described, this is like single-purpose thing. So as long as you have all stores, um, store APIs, so um, two sidecars from Veggie and one from Fruit we will have all the data, right? So this is kind of our admin tomato view, um, whatever you want to call. It. Yeah, we see all the data, which is uh, not great if you want to ensure some isolation. So let's let's actually go for prom label proxy project, right? So it is as simple as, uh, yeah, this is like a stateless uh, proxy with where you point the upstream and URL, which is like where your multi-tenant query is. 
and then what's the listing part and the key part is that what's the label and because as you can see our Prometheus have three labels and one of them is tenant describing critically you know what team this Prometheus is um, is part of um, we can kind of isolate tenants based on that so once we create the proxy, uh, let's leverage this proxy with some kind of auth. Um, and I choose the Caddy server, which is like a fancy engines. Um, and there is some configuration, very simple configuration, which exposes two ports, uh, 39091 for uh, Team Fruit. So in this port, it will just append um, the, the par parameter to the URL um, portion uh, with tenant equals Team Fruit. And there is a second part which will inject tenant equals team veggie. So depending on what part you are um, using, it should inject the correct parameter. Um, and also it points to the um, prom label proxy that understands this parameter and kind of knows how to inject that into query, into other critical Prometheus APIs. So once we start that, um, we should have a query for fruit team which is which should actually give us um yeah only team fruit data even though this kind of query have access to all of the stores right and kind of the same will be for veggie team just uh it isolate for it has all the sidecars even team fruit however we can see only um only go routines let's say or like yeah mem sub gc gc cpu fraction for team veggie so that's the whole point um, of this demo. Um, let's go back to slides. Um, and I think we don't have, you know, a um, long time here to describe all of this. And hopefully maybe on the next KubeCons we can demo um, further multi-tenancy parts because we talked about, you know, read path of the multi-tenant, uh, multi you know, reads isolation. But um, there is much more. We already solved, you know, storage, soft tenancy, where you maybe uh, include upload order blocks, all the data into same, same uh, bucket. You can totally do that. It's still multi-tenant. Uh, you can have a, a separate buckets uh, for each tenant. That's okay. We call it hard tenancy. Um, and the same for receiver. We can we build receiver with multi-tenancy in mind. So you can have soft tenancy where um, you have just same ingestion receiver nodes um, used for multiple tenants building, you know, separate blocks still, but um, same ingestion path. Um, but you can have hard tenancy where you distinct ingestion nodes to make sure it's it's just much safer and you can have greater SLA SLO on that. Um, so that's it from the multi-tenancy, and uh, I know many people really looking forward to that, and and we are leveraging we are leveraging that at Red Hat as well. So this is pretty exciting to actually yeah prepare a demo so to to showcase um, showcase this for you. All right, and last but not the least, we are not stopping. We have lots of lots of stuff to do. Um, quickly mentioning, you know, bucket viewer. Uh, we want to contribute that to Prometheus. We want to uh, have finally proper deletions, uh, backfilling in tunnels, uh, query of dev safeguards. So we are uh, working hard on making sure um, your infrastructure is stable, especially in the multi-tenant scenarios. Uh, performance improvements, like really uh, lots of lots of help from community to to make that happen. So it's pretty amazing, and uh, yeah, some different cache backend supports. And I want to also mention the mentorship. Like we spent an amazing couple of months of me on mentoring like multiple amazing people, and uh, some of them are you know becoming tunnels maintainers and, or like you know helping us with the community. Actually, starting some CNCF meetups as well. So yeah, um, if you want to mentor someone or mentored or be mentored, yeah, please uh, be uh, yeah. Follow our Twitter and and from Twitter to to get more info. Yeah, we are happy to to help in some way. Thank you. Um, that's it. And yeah, we are happy to take questions. <laughs>